Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Listening to the Voices in Our Heads. Are you ready to listen to the voices in two really epic world builders' minds? Let's get started. It's another epic evening of sitting down with somebody I adore. My name is Jenna O'Malley. I'm very glad to be sitting down with Listening to the Voices in Our Heads, a podcast where creative people sit down and talk about their creative processes in a world not necessarily built for their world building and healing. The person joining me tonight is someone that we know, adore, love, and honestly, we call her the mom with all the links for a reason. And she's often modding somebody's chat somewhere or cheering you on. Her name is Mama Maggie. Welcome, my dear. Tell us a little bit about yourself, my sweetheart. Hello, lovelies. I am Mama Maggie Ward, independent author and stroke survivor. So if my brain damaged brain can spit out all the creativity and create all these lovely books, then so can your brain. So I am completely completely here to encourage everyone today because we all need it. Seriously, 2024, you do not have to show up your older siblings. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> it's like you remember you're talking to the youngest of five kids who's also the only one who has ovaries and a uterus. Wait a I minute. Told us, the oldest, the oldest. <laughs> Four kids, two foster kids. Yeah. Two stepbrothers. Yeah. So, yeah. Totally, you understand. Totally. I totally understand. And I do not understand this trend of the of 2020s to just be like, dumpster fire. You call it whole barge of dumpster for a reason. fire. Yeah. Comet crashing onto dumpster fire barge. <laughs> Alrighty, let's go ahead and say hello. I did drop a couple, a couple, a couple of links. It's going to be a fun chat. It's going to be a fun chat. I literally, as of 4 p.m., like three hours ago, started spring break, everybody. So I'm thrilled to be doing the start to my spring break with Mama Maggie. So um, also, uh, could you explain the story of Tumwaddle? Okay, um couple years ago, back, back in the pandy days, um, lovely, lovely Devin, Devin, um, had a page and that page is where all of the stream links he would put up all these playlists for daily streams. It's and, where the tiny URL slash author to got he was, inspired he was from. literally the, he was the, literally the, the guy with all the links. He was the tub waddle. And then I was the tum waddle because I would do the modding and I would load up pages. I would have links for people and um have pages of links when i'm hosting things and stuff so i was always sharing the links and so i he was the tug waddle the guy with all the links and i was the tongue waddle the mama with all the links and we would just snap out the links because the only people that are going to help indie authors are other indie authors and that is exactly. that is one thing and we our community and we have such a close community. We have such a lovely little corner of YouTube. And, but yeah, there are some kind of like elitists that, you know, you can only be a writer if you're schooled, if you have the proper education. Literary fiction is the only, yeah, no. Oh. If you love I writing, have that. And I will say people do way better than I do. Just say yeah, if, if you love writing, if you love storytelling, you know, don't, you know, don't think about that, you know, the great author dream that's under the new age of Amazon and market for money and like literature, literature for money only of the penguin. Uh, we know from all of that, all of those hearings from, I'm, I'm not, I need to not name them because it's, it, they, yes, they, they shall lost not those. be named. They shall not be named. The the four five four five book houses who shall not be named, who have their obligatory minority authors, and why can't you write something from your 
ethnic diversity background that makes you seem oppressed. Um, no, I'm a, I'm a sci-fi writer. I, I, I uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm just, you know, this half Native American, half Anglo-Saxon, Scottish person who grew up in Texas, surrounded by other people of half ethnicities. And I grew up in that storytelling vein. And I, I don't want to tell reservation dogs. That's not my story. My, my family managed to escape that horror. And it's, I just love writing sci-fi. I really do Thanks. love writing science fiction. And that's just what I do. And I love telling stories. I've got, um, it's just, it's, um, it's so I've fun. got a couple links that I'm trilling through yeah. while you're talking there. So the one I'm saying, hence here, Mama Maggie just released a book recently. If you want to go and check out the book page, there you are. But I know I have a lot of fellow authors sitting in there on the live and replay doing the whole, you know, hopefully like, comment, and subscribe mode, both on our channel here and over at Mama Maggie's channel too, which is pinned on the YouTube chat for everybody. She also does launch parties for her books. So if you are an author yeah. looking for an example of how to run a launch stream, Mama Maggie's done what? 10 at least? Um, just, I've done eight, uh, seven for this series. Um, the three ghost with, ghost with cats, ghost with ink and ghost with hope. That's the ghost writer series. Um, there were the Pagosa cliff series. Um, I like at 30 books now, but no, the thing with doing a launch party is, is, and it's, it seems very intimidating because you're like, here, let me pull out a book without dropping anything. Okay. Here's my book. Please buy it. No. You did that smoothly too. Well done. Yeah. No, don't be afraid of sharing your story. You love your story. These are your words. You don't get... You have to treat your book babies like your real babies. You have to let them go out into the world and be like, okay, it's okay if they fail. It's okay if they get stuffed up. You are completely redoing the Myrna Annals right now, which is a huge thing. It is a huge thing that you are doing that because that is a big, big reset. But when you're doing a book like this, like this, this one is my, my, my trilogy from two years ago. If you're doing this, one of the things you need to do is, um, Unfortunately, Amazon's made it really hard for us to be sure we have our printed book copies on time. And the other thing is, so just go ahead. It's okay to have just a screenshot of your of your cover to show. That is perfectly fine. Go in there, interge engage with the chat. Put it up a few days ahead of time. Do one or two partial cover reveals. Like you can get like a torn paper thing to put over your cover to like obscure part of the cover and just show it. And that's what I do. Uh, and it's just, and you don't have to do this obsessive, like, like to talk about, you have to do a one year build up and share snippets every week and blah, blah, blah. I know someone who did that and she, she, she killed her book because she was oh, trying yeah. to stay on their pace. And I've told you about this a couple years ago, she went to put out her book, but by the time she got to putting out her book, everyone had seen so many blurbs and so many snippets and so many things that everybody felt like they had read the book. And her sales were friends small. and family. And that was it. Because everybody, you go back through her social media and you can get the whole story, you, all the characters, everything. And so you don't have to roll up. And the other thing is, this marketing is expensive. If you, if you throw out all of this money on marketing and you don't get the sales back in, then you're in debt that you might not have been able to afford as an independent author, because, you know, unfortunately not all of us do this for an, for an income because yeah. We it's are in the process of gearing up to make that happen though, is what I would love to say. Yeah. We would, we would all like to have that income, but yeah. But the thing is, is, is just like in, engage with the chat, you know, what pick a number between this and this, and I'll read you this page. Pick a number yeah. between these and I'll read you this page. You know, 
um, I'm going to set up a wheelie and do a draw and whoever wins gets a free e-copy of the book. I'll email you the e-copy or movie of the book. And that's a great thing. Another thing you can do is if you are on Amazon and like you have a, like me, you have a backlist. The one thing I did running up to this one is this was Terrorth Falling was the eighth book in the series. And I have a four book prequel and the previous seven books. Mm -hmm. So what I was able to do was go through and Amazon gives you five free days a year, which means you can put your books for free. Don't use them all at one time. This, this is, this is, this is mama giving you some advice. Use one free day, one free book per day for the week leading up to your next launch, a few free books on the day of your launch. And that keeps traffic to your page. Not only that, Having people come to your page every day to come and get a free book puts you on Amazon's algorithm. It it gives them that idea that, oh, people are going here. Let's make this a little more visible. And even though, you know, I ended up giving away 39 free books this, this time, I also sold 19 books. So that's actually almost you made back half. That's really good. Yeah. So, oh so yeah. And if you, if you're finally qualifying for the 99 cent sales, if you don't have a book launching in that month, like I do my books, like, because I have this giant series right now that I am grinding through all of the editing and rewriting relic of time wars is 1.4 million words. The By the way, congratulations thing. on that still today. I'm still so impressed. Congratulations. The, the entire initial series was written before I ever published the first book. So what you do is if, if you're not, if you've got a month here, a month there, you're not publishing. If you've got a backlist, put some 99 cent sales out there. Run That's them. That's a good idea. Because it brings the traffic back to your page. Now I'm not an expert in this. I'm not an expert on Amazon marketing. This is just what has worked for me. Um, um, bad months to do sales. And I hate to say this bad months to do sales are April. April is yeah. a bad month. Yeah. April is a bad month to do sales because everybody's paying out their taxes. Um, another bad month. At least sales, here in the States. That's very true. Um, believe it or not. I have, um, everyone says December's a bad month. I have not had bad sales months in the December's. January more so than December for me. Um, I, I, I've been okay in January. October. October is the month I never get any sales, no matter what right I do. Right before the holidays, yeah. And School August. School just started, and it's August. right before the holidays, yep. August, and then October. And then April, those are my, those are my zero sale months. It doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter what, if I launch, if I sell, whatever, nothing in those months, because I don't know why for October, but I know that those other months. That's funny. Just because of Nano and April writer brain, not reader brain. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it, no, it's well. And the other thing is, is April is often spring break and Easter. Yep. That's hit around there. So people are gone. They're not, you know, they're doing things with their families. They're not sitting with their Kindle. Right. So speaking of families, let's go ahead and loop back to, we've already gone off track. We haven't even gotten we to are scheduled so questions. Far off track. <laughs> we, are, we are 13 minutes in and we have like, let's, let's And jump. nobody knows. Nobody let's, knows because the show's just gone on. Let's jump into the Amazon deeps. So... For the audience, then, you mentioned family. Let's segue. Why are words important across age groups, then? Because you've been telling stories to your kids since they were old enough to listen, is what I yeah. gather. So um, I grew up in a mixed family. Um, mm -hmm. My um, my husband is, he's that typical American family from the Midwest that, that came over from Northern Europe. So of course he is like blondie white sunburns attracts mosquitoes. You know that life. Um, 
No, not at all. I just married the Pennsylvania version, honey. <laughs> but um, I'm from a family of storytellers from historic, you know, and it's just, it's something I've always done. Um, I hadn't formally written since college. You know, I stopped writing in college. I had my career. I had two different careers. I had kids, have the farm the whole time. And, but the, the thing with storytelling is as a Native American, we lost a lot, a lot there, believe it or not, a lot of the Native tribes actually had written language, which we lost during the smallpox pandemics. Sure during the is. colonization and um unfortunately so we we're this oral tradition now where you tell stories generationally my grandfather told me stories i tell my children stories and it just keeps going he had stories from his mother my grandmother had stories from her father and so it the stories go generationally and that was how our history was preserved but it, there's also it's not just history and religious beliefs that are preserved this way. There's also moral stories like Aesop's fables. We all know Aesop's fables. and um, Or just, something from another culture that's basically comparative to, I'm looking at yeah, you, the, the story the, of the spiders from Africa. Yeah, the equivalent of all of these traditional, and it's just common sense learning that gets passed down. But there's also warnings in this story. There are warnings like, um, big disasters that happened. I mean, if you look at Noah's flood, we have this in the Judeo-Christian Bible. We have this in the Torah. We have this um, in the mythology of Babylon because there is actually written copies. It is mentioned in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh. I was it, just about to say that one. It's like, don't forget the Sanskrit language has it too. Yeah, it's, it's the, and it's the in the Egypt, even the Egyptians talk about this flood that flooded all the land. And so you yep. have these stories and it's words aren't just things in books to just like write down and put away. They're things to be um, lived. They're ways to experience other people's lives. People who you may never know, you may never be, meet, but you can read their words and you can literally experience their lives. And um, I could like go off on a side thing about like the book burning and book banning issues. And th this, oh, has geez, happened. Considering this has happened cyclically. If you look at what is happening now, it has happened cyclically. And the thing is, is they're claiming they're banning these little tiny small amount of books but realistically, if you look at the books that are being removed, it is, you know, oh, well, this book is racist. And it's like, this book is a black woman writing about a black woman's life in the 1960s. How is it's this? contextually appropriate it's, if you're it's, reading it as it's, it's meant like, to be read. You know, and it's like, you know, they like you know, they're trying to remove the diary of Anne Frank. The diary of Anne Frank is very important for noticing this. And, you know, as a teacher, as a teacher and, and I've an taught anthropologist it. and an anthropologist here, because I have a minor degree in anthropology and another minor degree in world religion from Jeez. Dallas County Community College in Texas. And I can tell you that from our point of view, oh, we could rant for days on this about how bad it is to do this. And this, you are literally destroying a not, not as we talk in writing about voice as in style, you are literally grabbing somebody by their throat and by their hands and choking them. And then like, um, and I know this is an unpopular opinion with younger Native Americans, Native Americans my age don't see it this way. Having the names of our tribes removed from streets, removed from sports teams. Now, the Redskins, yeah, that is a very derogatory term. Please take that away. Thank you very much. Please. But when you Please remove do. and I'm saying that the as names someone who of lives the near. tribes that no longer live in these areas that were forcibly removed and replacing it with oak and elm and first and second. You're erasing us, our presence on that land 
is now gone completely. Not even our names remain there. And it's that's what happens when you start banning books. Now, do I think that perverts and pedophiles deserve to have books in elementary schools? Oh, hell no. No, 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 no. They need to and be. And by the way, since, since you corrected yourself, in my opinion, the rule of my channel mm -hmm. is y'all's are allowed to cuss because you're guests. I'm not supposed I'm, to. I, I, it. I, I'm trying not to get too passionate, but you know how you know how I am. I will I will soapbox for days about this. And you're Native it, American it, and Scottish. I expect nothing less. <laughs> we need we need we need our history held on to. We need the clearness of thought of different perspectives and this idea that only one side or the other side is right. The on, the idea that there is no longer any middle ground, that is the lie that destroys empires. Great. And that's my soapbox. That's and well, we're so about we're to possibly move to another one you're very passionate about because you're a mom. So this might take up two things. Is it going to split it? Oh, it all came through as one. It was short what? enough. So why should what? parents cultivate creativity in their children? And what are some ways busy authors can balance parenting time with creative mentorship in their relationships with said children? Because you have how many kids? I have three daughters. And Sounds like all, so many and, more. And all of our, well, all of their friends. I was, I'm the supportive, honest mom. So all of their friends came with them. I understand this. My mom, all of my friends from high school still call my mom, mom. You probably have kids who say the same. <laughs> Yeah. And, and the thing, the, the, the important nature of cultivating creativity is that if you don't cultivate creativity, people cannot problem solve. That is the very first step. If you cannot think creatively, you cannot even begin to problem solve because you will have a problem. Someone will say, this is the answer. And you will take that as the only answer forever. You will continue fixing the problem the exact same way and never think about it another way. If you, if you don't learn that there are other ways, and then you'll hit a situation where that answer no longer applies and you, they freak out because they don't know how to solve the problem because, well, shouldn't it be this way? And like the perfect example is I knew someone who was, who was very, he, very logic minded, extremely. I mean, he, his OCD made my OCD look like it didn't exist. And he was walking in the middle of the road and it's like, what are you doing? You know, I told you don't walk on because he had been walking on the line on the side of the road and it was like, don't walk on the yellow line. Don't walk on that line. So he moved to the to the to the other line. And it's like, no, 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 you have to be off the road. But that's not the you you have to be on the shoulder of the road, but it's still all the road. And, so you know, he had to he had to break down things in a process to figure it out. I mean, super intelligent guy. I mean, he could write coding out by hand like C++ coding. I've seen this guy write it on a tablecloth in a Sharpie. He, that kind of brilliant. That kind of brilliant. Wow. But he dre he was like Einstein. He dressed every the same outfit every single day until we taught him how to match outfits. And like gray goes with gray and blue I goes with blue. I still don't know how to do that. You might have to teach me, mom. It was it was fine. It, he was he he has a lovely wife now. Um but it just it Oh no, she's, she's the, oh, here's the thing though, is because he doesn't perceive how people look. He has no idea about this. He ended up marrying to basically this, this nurse who could be a Scandinavian supermodel. And everyone was like, how did you land her? And she goes, oh, he loves me. It doesn't care what I look like. And that's and, probably the first time in her whole life she had someone yeah. treat her like but, that, to be fair. Yeah, sidetrack though, but back to creativity. If you don't know, if you can't start creativity, creative thinking, you can't problem solve. The other thing with creativity as a parent, you want your children to be creative in the same things you are. 
However, this is a big however, most of the time they're not. Most of the time, your children's creativity does not follow your path of creativity. So it is very important as a parent to foster their own creativity. I have a child who paints. I have a child who writes. I have a child who um, fosters her creativity through video games. She builds like, like Taj Mahal level palaces in Ark and Minecraft and, and all of this other stuff. She does these amazing architectural type things. And the creativity, I mean, if your daughter's creativity is doing art nails, then by all means, buy her a thousand different colors of fine brushes and nail polish and lacquers and and let her do that. Because by all means, yeah. it, you cannot make your child be creative in something they're not interested in. And as the parent, it's your job to support them and encourage them, which means you take this journey down something you're not interested in. Like naming every single My Little Pony that ever existed, ever, ever, ever. Ever? Not Pokemon. I can do that with Pokemon too. The first thousand Pokemon, I can almost, I can identify almost all of them on site. Um, okay, you're doing better than me. I can do 50. But creativity is about thinking outside the box. It is about the ability to problem solve, the ability not to take something at face value. Because you can show someone... Um, where is it? Where is it? I don't have my coin. Okay. Here, we're going to use, we're going to use this. You can show someone a rock, literally just a rock. You can say, what is this? It's a rock. What, what else is, uh, is it about this rock? Well, it's covered in little blue crystals and it's a piece of granite. Tell me about the crystals. What are the crystals? Is it copper? Actually, it is copper. Yeah, tell me about this crystals. How do you make this color? If you had to tell a story about this crystal, this rock right. and these tiny crystals, how would you do that? How would you express this in a painting? How would you express this on someone's fingernails? How would you recreate this? Recreating the real breaches the first level of getting here out your fingertips because that is the biggest problem creatives face what is in their brain does not always come out their finger they can't figure out the translation now as a parent we're encouraged to put every kind of art supply around our children but that it's might not be overload yeah it it's do one art supply at a time find the one the child attaches to for one of my children it was painting and drawing and sketching from the time she was like three. One of the other ones, it was music. The other one, she was a champion, like an international team champion video gamer at 12. She was on teams that were like playing in the top 100 of the world. Jeez. And so their creativity might have nothing to do with your creativity but help them because it teaches them once they learn the translation, this to problem solve, to expression out the fingertips, that changes their whole worldview. And it also enables them to see through a lot of the whitewashing, graywashing media manipulations that are going on because they'll look at something and they'll go, uh -uh. One of these things does not belong here. You know, or or I saw that like two years ago and now it's different. Why is it different? And it makes them question because that's yep. another thing that goes along with creativity is curiosity. And that is the thing we have to encourage. 3000%. And uh, yeah, Cheesecake Man, there's way more than a thousand Pokemon just saying. <laughs> there's yeah, gotta um, yeah. be. Um, the Pokemon, Pokemon Black, wrap would take 15 minutes by now. Pokemon Black and White is where they hit the thousand mark, I think. That was a while back, too. That Jeez. was a while back. My oldest is 25, so... Okay, Google. How many Pokemon are there 2024? There are officially 1,025. 
down. Yeah, I could, I could, um, I think when I took a test, I got like 700. My kid just showing me different cards and she had a stack that was like two stacks that were like that tall. Nope, I can do 50. That's it. <laughs> Are genres meant to be blended? And if not, if so or not, how and why? That was a confusing question. Um, I think so. I only write blended genres, so I'm really not the person of that. But I think that I think the world is getting, I think of the readers specifically are getting tired of the exact same genre. Um, unfortunately, I think I think today's market for the and they're they're tending toward the blended genres um, shows their want for good storytelling. It shows mm. their 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 desire to read something new. Um, I know that. Uh, should I go on my soapbox about the romantic thing? I mean, you're kind of talking to somebody who writes romantic, so I go know, ahead. I know you <laughs> have good world building and you have good characters, and you didn't yeah. just plug random elves, vampires, aliens, gargoyles, whatever, into your bad Are you boy. Just sure about that. <laughs> Into your bad boy billionaire romance with a lack I'm of so consent. Sure yes, I'm sure about that. The Myrna Annals are not like that at all. Um, but it's like it, but you know, a certain author made that big, and you know, unfortunately, layering genre blending is like making a layer cake. You can't just like slap a layer and some frosting onto something and say, oh, this is science fantasy science now. This is science fiction fantasy now, which is what I write. Or, oh, this is adventure with, you know, dark elf adventures or, you know, this is urban gothic with vampires. And, no, it's a bad boy. It's your bad boy billionaire romance that you couldn't get picked up. So now you just like changed it to be you know, a, a, a vampire and you really haven't changed anything at all about the story of the world building. Uh, just, and th my biggest problem with this whole thing is, is, is that, that there, it, it, especially, you know, my problems with the billionaire bad boy romances and the boss romances yes. that the HR department would be crawling all over them like the next day. Too um, true. Yeah. You can't just find replace mafia billionaire bad boy with elf alien vampire and have a good story. World building, I am I will preach world building. I am the person that has world building documents that are 2000 5000 50000 words. Her <laughs> world building put my world building one notes to yeah, snooze world. <laughs> it's, the thing Big is, is you, you have you have to figure out every angle before you go into something, or you end up on your second on your copy read when you're starting to do your copy edits. You end up on your copy read. You end up with this plot hole, and you're like, "Oh, well, what do I do here? How am I going to fix this?" And if you've already published book one. We all know that series that went four books in and then threw all the rules out the window. And then suddenly in book seven, they were back. They're back. They were back. Yeah. And, you know, and a certain very popular romanticy that is going around right now with the Elven Courts, how the world building rules magically appear and disappear or a certain dragon rider series where um you cannot claim disability representation if the disability appears and disappears and you can't really say that if you mock other disabilities and make no mention of the fact that oh yeah like a third of the people that went in there were eaten and killed you know that's not a sleight of hand comment, not at all. Yeah, no. So you no. can see why there's a rightful side to this romance. Yeah, has so, a bad so, rap, and I'll admit it does. 
Yeah. And the thing is, is the bad thing is, is though, writers who have a really good romantic series are unfortunately like writers that had really good werewolf books. Yep. And they're just the really good shifter romances are getting slogged under the pile of all of this. So they're there. If, if you're blending a genre, know the rules for both genres, know that you can bend those rules. That is one thing. Yep. It's like the law of laws of science. You can bend them almost Don't to the breaking point, point, but you can bend them really far. Um, be honest with yourself about what tropes you're writing. Don't overload tropes from both things into your books. This is and, where I like Sarah Cannon's comparison of a buffet. It applies here too. Yeah. Pick your plate wisely. Pick your plate wisely. All right. Um, yeah. All, um, I'm looking at my notes. Um, no, you're fine. I kind of threw you off. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. No, but it's yeah, just, it's, just, it's I was just realizing like, it, like, you're right. You know, it is kind of buffet. Yeah, it is. It is. It, or it's like, it's like listening to fusion music or going to a fusion restaurant where you have like, Polynesian and like barbecue together. So you have that nice poly barbecue mix that I just love. Or like you go to like, uh, um, what was it? I, w I went to a restaurant and this is so common now. And, but I remember years ago in Texas, there was a restaurant that was doing like burgers, but with a tech, uh, Tex-Mex fusion. And so you were in, we were ending up with like Pico burgers and like barbecue on nachos and things like really amazing food. And it's like, the th I think my stomach might start growling. Oh my God. And that's, that's the thing though. When you are blending a genre, mix your flavors carefully because you don't want to end up with, with like something that like taste leaves a bad taste in your reader that you want them you want them to finish your book and be like, mm, I, I, I could eat some more of that. And no, and not this though, Eva. No. <laughs> you can actually order a nacho pizza from the 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 combo, the Pizza Hut Taco Bell combo locations. You can go in and ask them. They're, they're, I don't know if they're still doing it, but it used to be on the menu. You can ask them for a nachos, the beef nachos on a pizza. And don't will, say that because Cheesecake Man's in chat. Don't say that. Oh, it's horrid. You don't want that, Cheesecake Man. You don't. Even my husband, who isn't, who never says no to fast food, will eat that. We have A.W. and Long John's on occasion up this far north, but I haven't seen a Pizza Hut and Taco Bell since... God. Yeah, you're right. That's the fish place. God, for... A decade or more. Yeah. Wow. We still have you, them ar around here. We have them around here. Yeah, Eva, Long John's are underwear. They're also fish. Fish food and really bad shrimp. But <laughs> they have they have amazing hush puppies. I don't know what they put in those hush puppies. It's They're literally <laughs> just the breading. It, it's the stuff that they dip their... Oh, my God. Um, yes. Ten taco huts. That's what they used to be. Yes. All right. So we're kind of. It's not a taco pizza. <laughs> so if you could marry one of your characters, date one of your characters, you see where we're going with this game here. Or oh, yeah. alive one of your characters. Who and why? Okay. The marry the character. This is this is this is the most marriageable character I have in the entire series. In all of my books everywhere. And this is uh, the guardian High Lord Caleth of Anamos. This is Daisy. Yes! Daisy's husband from Relic of Time Wars. He is a guardian. So his primary job, basically, he, as the last guardian, is to protect his people. He's like the super warrior, basically. Um, and he's married to, to this, like, OCD scientist. And But here's the thing. He is also, he is this wonderful father. He is this amazing husband. He and Daisy were literally, he, he knew that she was his soulmate from the first kiss they ever had. And um, he had to leave her because he was supposed to something, something in the past. And then he spent like 2000 years 
waiting to be reunited with her because he knew they would be reunited at this specific point. So he spent, I mean, that's a love, that's I've loved you for a thousand years kind of love. And she was in love with him. She didn't really understand it. They struggled. They have a, they have some struggle bus times, especially in Etheria Rising. They have some struggle bus that they get through with their marriage, but he's this amazing husband. He's this totally devoted father, loves his children, and he's a gourmet chef. He, he often says, if I could just quit being the guardian of Etheria, I would, I would just like have a cafe somewhere. And that's, he and Daisy talk about just when they retire, she's going to run a lighthouse and have a little school and he's going to run the cafe and they're going to have happily ever after. No. Um, <laughs> because and you so, need to keep so, writing books. But, but the problem is, the problem is, is because Caleb is one of, it's one, one of those age gap romance things because he is older, he thinks he knows better. And so he keeps secrets and what always happens when secrets are kept. In the end. So, yeah. So when the secrets come out, pff, bad things happen. But yeah, if it if if I could marry any of them, it would be Kayla and I would never have to cook or bake again. <laughs> Which, if you know anything about Mama Maggie, one of the it's reasons why we end up talking about food all the time in chats is Mama I, Maggie. I, I bake and, and cook constantly. I'm a foodie. I love food. Okay. Um, the one that I would date is definitely my scrumptious Sheriff Ta Tank Tanner from Pagosa Cliffs. I mean, who wouldn't want an ex-NFL pro bowler with golden blonde hair and eyes the color of the summer sky who, yeah, he's he struggles with his alcoholism, but he still works out a lot as a sheriff. You know, he works out a lot so that he does not. He has his one and done rule. One and done, occasionally something will upset him and he will finish one bottle and start on the next. But pretty much he's the one and done kind of guy and he works out to keep his stress out. So at 45, he is still buff as his football days. And that's always a plus. Plus he's a gentleman rancher. And that's always a plus. <laughs> so definitely would date him. More, we definitely, and, and I have a lot of readers who are like, oh yeah, I'd ride the corral with him once or twice. <laughs> and then on a live, who gets on your nerves? Um, um, there are actually two characters. Um, well, three, technically three. Um, one character that I wrote for Ghost Cliffs, Lloyd McConnell. He is, he comes, he comes with his own freight train of baggage which he works through slowly his his arc in the Pagosa Cliff series is him learning to trust and love again because after the things with his high school sweetheart and becoming her third husband and the betrayal that happened um with his cousin right after high school and all of the stuff that he's been through he has trust issues that would fill the Atlantic Basin and so when he falls in love again, the first rumor he hears, he's like, I'm outie. And he like hurts his second chance at love, like hurts her to the point that she's like, yeah, no, we're just going to be friends now. That's it. And then things happen. And when he tries to get her back, she's like, look, the answer is no. The answer is no. And it, it will always be no. I will be your friend. I will always be your friend. But the answer is no. And it's like, he's just like, I, 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 I screwed up. I never should have sent you away. I never should have hurt you. And she's like, I know that. And I'm glad that you know that now. But however, but our chance is gone. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's very, um, he's one of them that there were so many times I was like, I'm going to murder you. And TDM, the dramatic Mara, my lovely editor and middle, she was like, she like literally was like, hashtag no love for Lloyd, hashtag Lloyd <laughs> dies alone, hashtag I'm going to murder Lloyd this chapter. And it's, it was so funny because I was putting up the rough drafts of the chapter on Inkit. As I do, I put up my roughs on Inkit because I know not everyone can afford a candle and I leave my roughs up for free forever. Mm -hmm. I want to read read the roughs of my books for free before I flushed out the story and added stuff. You can go to my Inkit page 
and read everything I've ever written. But no, she was like, we were, she was like, I'm going to kill Lloyd. Lloyd is going to, I will go to Pagosa Cliffs and kill him. And I'm like, you can't go oh to Pagosa Cliffs. Oh my goodness. Cliffs. I will try. And it's, and it's so funny, but, um, he, he's one of them that I want that I just, there were times I wanted to strangle him. Um, when I was writing ghost with cats, the ghost with series, um, Edmund tall of Vanth, um, I, he just, he just also struggled bus writing him. He never wanted to do what I wanted him to do. He never wanted, you know, and, and I'm like, okay, fine. You want to do this? We're going to put you in a place of pain. Oh, yeah. Show, point him. Point at him. Mm -hmm, him. Bjorn's the same way. Bjorn's the same way. I cannot yeah, stand yeah, it's being like, in his head. It's like, I'm going to lock you in. I'm going to lock you in prison so you can quit being a jerk. Um, Rochelle does that for me. Thanks. Yeah. And then uh, the other one is... Um, um, Damien Evadamos, who is Kayla's younger son. And it, the problem, the thing with is it's a double-edged sword because um, Damien starts off as this really, really good person. He and Karstein are the chosen ones. They are chosen to rebuild the Aetherian Empire, to lead the followers of the light against the shadows. But there's a prophecy, if a son of Adamos falls into shadow, war will come and it will come more than once and and damien his his just the shadows start feeding his entitlement and his arrogance yeah and he's just one of those people who instead of you know no i'm not going to do this he just starts eating it up and there is a part in if you read the second half of war of prophecies you get to see Damien part of his life when he's not influenced by the shadows and he's back to being a good person. And he's back to being, he is the noble ruler. And he actually, I have him like uh, live this life. He's just basically hopping from lifetime to lifetime. And he lives a life as Gaius Julius Caesar. Oh, he wow. Rescues, he rescues Aurelia from a shipwreck, which it, it is true. She was shipwrecked on an unknown island. The entire Asian fleet went looking for her and they found them on an island. So this, so I, I really worked hard to overlap fact with fiction, the historical facts with this. And then I had him live the life as, you know, the, the, the considerate ruler, the advocate, the the lawyer, the person who tried to help people. He tried to be a good man. And then his wife died while giving birth to their child. And then and his daughter all. died yeah. while giving birth to her child. And if you look at history, that's when Caesar changed. That's when he became the brutal dictator. And there's a scene that happens in Terror Falling where Daisy and Karstein and Kalith go to meet Damien and they're like, look, we will give you a, an uninhabited planet. We will seed the world to any biome you want. Just don't harvest Terror Earth. There are 8 billion people. We can't get them off. And, 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 and she's like, so they go to negotiate with Damien and Damien says, I want to dance first. I don't want to do this. And he basically forces Daisy to dance with him. And uh, the chapter is called Dance of Enemies. And it touches on Rightfully my love so. of, of ballroom dancing because they're, they're dancing. They're, first they dance a waltz and then they dance a, um, a pasadobo, which is perfect for them Please. because it's the That's dance crazy. of enemies. And she asks him, she's like, what happened to you? You were a good man. You were a good father. You were a good ruler. You were a good husband. Why go back to this, the evil one? And he's like, I tried to live my brother's life. And every time I tried to build a kingdom, the envious and the jealous manipulated it and took it away from me. Yep. And it's very interesting because it shows in the books in the book, I talk about how the shadows are manipulating the, they can't manipulate Damien at this point 
but they can manipulate everyone around him. Around him. And yep. so it skews his perception. And then I get to talk touch on this lovely thing called Nero Redavitis, which means Nero revives, which there is, a, if you don't know this, there is a legend about Nero returning from the dead three or five different times during the 200 years after his death and leading armies against Rome, which is a very interesting thing to be able to put it, fold into a fiction where the one of the main characters is an immortal. And you all see why I love her books, because the world building is, like she said, layered. Yeah, it's you severely layered. Oh, my goodness. And that's why I'm going to throw in an additional plug here, a book that often comes up when we talk that hasn't come up yet. She also <laughs> writes awesome books like How to Become a Crazy Cat Lady and to Survive the Zompocalypse. Love this book. What was the original idea behind this one? I'm curious to hear the story again. Okay, the original idea behind this one was cats versus zombies. And on the side of that, I was like, okay, I, I hate the zombie trope. I really, I have troubles with it. I uh, Max Brooks, um, the World War Z uh, yes. book is actually, if you read Max Brooks, it's, it's a collection of short stories. But the thing I liked about his books is the zombies decay. And, and I actually had a medical background. I was in, um, I was studying for a master's degree in nurses. And then my mother became very ill and I had to quit school to take care of her. And so um, that always bothered me about all of the zombie horror things is the zombies would partially decay and then suddenly they'd stop decaying. And that just drove me crazy. I'm like, look, if a, if a body in the South, if you die, Atlanta is not going to be full of walking corpses. Atlanta is going to be full of piles of goo with bones sticking out. Because <laughs> literally in the summer in Atlanta, yeah, decomp happens really, really fast. And so um, that was the thing that always drove me crazy, crazy, crazy about zombie movies. And so they've started added this food additive to um, everything now. And they can label it as organic because it's it's a fungus and funguses are under the GMO Act. So what they did is they took Terula yeast, which is a type of candida yeast, and it excretes monosodium glutamate salt as a natural byproduct of its metabolism. So they tweaked it a little bit so it excretes large amounts. It's like, so now instead of making monosodium glutamate in a chemical vat, chemically creating the salt, they grow terula yeast, which excretes it as part of its meta metabolic process. Then they put it in this thing and dry it out, powder it up, and now they're putting it in food it's still monosodium glutamate. The chemical does not change, only the source change. But because the source is now a living thing, instead of a chemical vat, they can label it as organic. And as someone who suffers from migraines chronically, monosodium glutamate, too much of it will actually send me into seizures. So and you don't eat a lot of fast food Asian stuff. I have to look everywhere. I, 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 it's like my food, when they author, when the food lobbyist paid the FDA un unknown billions of dollars to approve Tarula yeast to go into our entire American food market. Now, it's not in Asia or Europe. There are a lot of countries that do not use it. That's true. So it's, it's crazy. But so this idea of, well, what if there was a fungus that, you know, was a food preservative and it made all the food never decay. And so if you got zombieism from eating this fungus, then you would never decay because they're already noticing fun fact, side fact on the side fact, um, um, human bodies are now de decaying like 30% slower than they ever did because of the amount of preservatives we eat. We are pre-preserved before they ever embalm us. So that is happening. So I created this, uh, this idea where 
I went back and I looked through ancient pharaohs to find Prince Baccaray, Pharaoh Prince Baccaray, and the rebellion he caused against his family. And he was a sun worshiper and his name has been stricken from the records, but there are several records. And then there's like, I went through so much stuff, like we going back and forth with Egyptian history and even Assyrian history. There's even one of the Assyrian kings that he, he got a disease and he gave it to his concubines. And after he died, one of his sons went down there to take over the harem and the concubines were all diseased and crazy and they killed him. And I, I suspect he, it was probably syphilis, but you know, I did, it, they never determined it. We don't know. So I used it as a act of war where the Egyptians sent the Assyrians. We're going to send you all these dates covered in this, in this black ash because when the when the fungus dries, it leaves a black powder on everything and everyone who eats it gets sick. And then I had to do the metabolic ratios of how much you eat it and how long it takes to get ill, how much you eat, can you recover from it, all this stuff. And um, I, it was really fun to write this, that cats are the cure and that the ancient Egyptians had it right. Cats will protect you from zombies. And so the cats would fight the zombies and the zombies would run from cats. And so that was part of the thing and it was this food preservative and my poor librarian my poor meek introverted librarian with all of the food allergies she never gets infected because she has a yeast allergy so she doesn't eat anything you know it doesn't eat anything any kind of yeast any kind of um mushrooms or breads or anything and so what happened was um, she didn't get sick. And so she's like living at the Pratt Library in Baltimore doing her librarian thing. And these plays have come through. Like one Pause. Pause. I used to spend my childhood at that library. Stop. We, we talked about that library while I was writing the book. But yeah, so she's she's it still living. It gives me cool chills about that every time you mention that because my brain goes right to the front desk. I know this librarian personally, guys. And so she just she like she like because she's living in the basement of the library and the and every and because pan, this is pan, this is the the Pharaoh's plague is considered pandemic five, and the food lobbyists have literally paid billions of dollars to suppress the cause of it. So no one knows it's the food. Um, they send their, um, people send their, hello, Heather. How is life on the other side of the world? Oh, I was just about to say it's morning. <laughs> yeah, she's already getting ready for, she's on Friday. She's already yeah. on Friday. Um, but she's, um, but so yeah, she just, it's like, she like, like, goes to like goes out like two weeks mm -hmm. after the, like the shutdown she goes out to pick up her grocery order mm -hmm. and then she discovers that she has she has basically missed the apocalypse and she's just like you need to read this book guys it's a good read um but yeah and then she ends up with theodora who is in the very first chapter you meet theodora as this very mm -hmm. feisty 1920s child who is just she is lord carnivon's granddaughter and she's basically driving him and her friend across the Sahara Desert trying to get back to Cairo to the English fort there to get her grandfather to the to the doctors because he's sick with the zombieism plague and um so yeah you meet Theodora and then Babs um Theodora is one of Babs patrons um she lives um a couple miles away from the library between the marina and, um, oh, the name of the park. I can't think of the name of the park now. And now it's blanking my mind because all <laughs> I can think about is the bridge stuff that's going on down there. Yeah, right that's, now, that's, that's what's going on in my brain as I'm thinking about the bridge. Unfortunately. And um, the way, the, and the Tapsco that, Park, is it? Um, no. The um, park? No. Um, it's got the lake. It's the one that has the pond in it. There's the neighborhood there. Oh my gosh. There's a whole but there's a whole neighborhood of brownstones. Yeah, and, and my neighborhood's the next one over from that. That's yeah, you, like, you have to you, you have to go across the bridge and then go down through Little Italy and then you turn and you head north, um, and the park it and it's like six, 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 
She's like six streets down into that neighborhood. My brothers used to play there. I'm like, when they were you, kids, why can't I remember they, the name of this fish, park? They put fish in the pond every spring yep. so people can fish in the pond all, all summer. Yeah. So my local Baltimore people, if you know the name of the park she's talking about, even on the replay, throw it in the comments. Yeah. We're going to, we're at an hour in. We have three questions left. I'm going to go ahead and segue us to our next one, my dear. So we had a panel on this recently. And you did an amazing entry. Hashtag anime taught me. What has it taught you about writing that you would like to share with us, my friend? Um, the most important thing that anime, that I think anime shares about writing, the most important thing that I think it teaches you is that um, you can go to, you you can never go too far, but you can go too far. So you can go too far once, but you can't do it more than once. Just per chapter. But, this is, but no, the thing with anime is anime encourages you. And I'm a big fan of isekai anime. So I, I like that whole jump into another world kind of anime. Um, anime teaches you that um, you don't always, and because I've been thinking about this and there was so much. It's like, gosh, one thing. You don't She's always an know, anime addict. You don't always know the anime. You don't always know the motivations of the characters around you and even your own characters, a character that you're like, oh yeah, she's this thing. You will suddenly see something crack out and then like later it'll peek out a little more and then later it will peek out a little more. And then you're like, wait a minute, this, this character is completely not who I thought this character was. I just finished watching Metallic Rouge, so. Yeah, that's like the perfect example. That's exactly the perfect example. There's a storytelling structure they use uh, called Kisha Tenketsu. I probably said that wrong. It's a four act structure. And basically it's crazy, 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 crazy. And then suddenly veer in the opposite direction. <laughs> and, and a lot of that, those characters do just that. And the, and the ones that you think are your allies are not your allies. They're, they're, they actually work for the anime. Wait, wait no. No, they're your allies all along. They were your allies all along because of this thing. And the bad guys aren't really the bad guys. The person, the, the good guys are the bad guys. And the bad guys are the good guys. But the bad guys and the good guys are both bad guys. Yes. Wait, and what? And you're supposed to side with the bad guys, not the good guys. And that's and I, what always threw me off about anime when I was wee little. I can't side with that. You know me, I cannot side with those who purposely do harm. But no, it's, it's true. the thing with anime, the, the good thing about anime is anime shows you that it's okay to have that character with that in-depth moment. That character with that 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 deep revelation and then for them to be stupid like five minutes later. Because and, they have not had time human. to process. They have not had time to process. And we can call yes. this Ash Ketchum syndrome if we want because he always has this oh my god moment and then Pikachu has to suck it up and make it work. Yes. But so, he's how old? 12. Again. Okay. Anyway. So most 12 year olds would have that exact same reaction. Just saying. And but yes, not every, not every gym you go to. Not every week. Okay. Here's the cruel part though. Why give you a ground fire and electric? I'm sorry. A, a, a plant fire and electric type Pokemon to start with or a water type Pokemon to start with knowing that the first one's Brock and that the only way to beat him is to use one type. But then the very next gym in the game, you need the opposite type. Yeah. Thanks. Pretty Pokemon. Much. Yeah. If you want to see mama Maggie's episode that she contributed to what anime taught us about writing, you need it's to, okay see to be broken. One. It's okay to be broken. This one made me cry. I yeah. like good tears. I loved it. So let's go ahead to our next question before we go ahead and wrap up with these two. If anyone has any, go ahead and add them in the box now for Mama Maggie. What is the role of tarot in your writing? Okay. Um, a couple of years ago, like I know a lot of tarot people that are tarot enthusiasts, and I was actually researching a book where I have a character who's a tarot enthusiast. 
It's part of the Pagosa Cliff series. And um, uh, Cat Leo was, she uses tarot cards to determine the length of her sprints. She pulls cards and has number values. And we were talking about her and, and Glory and Megan and Sako Tumi. And there were, I can't even remember who all was there. There was a bunch of us. And I got turned on to this book. And then I spread it to you called Tarot for Writers. She's the reason why I love this book. And it's got like spreads and stuff, but it has like, it'll have like, um, it'll have a description of a card and then it'll have like ideas of, you know, opposing ideas, um, writing prompts. It's just, it's a great resource. And so I decided when I was doing cards on the table, it was the August 80K that I would pull three cards a day. And I actually bought specifically this deck to use that for cards. So on, pretty for card for that. They are beautiful, beautiful cards. Oops, upside down. So what I would do is every single day, I would pull. I love this card, the sun card with the butterflies and the sunflowers. That's my favorite. Um, every day I would pull. Every day I was going to write a chapter. I would pull three cards. And I would put the scenes, the ideas behind the three cards into the chapter. And I had a rough outline. I basically knew where the story was. It was in an established world. I knew I created my, I had drawn tarot to create characters, which I also did. A, and I did a series of tarot videos at that time, which you can find on my channel. Um, Getting the link now. Um. I believe they're in the um, um, Hold My Latte 2021 playlist um, where I did character building. I used the book to use character building, um, the Tarot for Writers to create characters, drawing cards. And I tested out several tarot decks. You know, this deck creates this thing. Um, I used the D&D deck, which was obviously not created by someone who really understood tarot because it, yeah. Um, I, I still, I've st I still have the plans to go back through and completely rework those cards into their proper suits. I have not gotten to that yet. I have so much to do. Um, but it was, it's, you can go through and um, if you're stuck, if you just want to take a break, if you, if you have writer's block, if you're in a place and you're stuck, you know, I'm not saying use tarot as a religion, you know, because like a lot of people find that offensive in our very Christianized Western world, but it can give you the impulse to like, if, okay, here's this card. It looks like this. Um, let me pull out this. See, that's um, what I tell people. It's literally a page from the book of the fool, AKA the human experience, yeah. because it's basically a snapshot in a person's life. Yeah. So like, okay, so this is the Marigold Terrible. And, and I wrote an entire book based on one of these cards. Well, three of these cards. Um, it's called death in the ADA. You can find it on my ingot page, but I love that one. But it's, but the thing is, is they, they give you a creative outlet. The image, just the image alone gives you a creative outlet. If you read behind it, um, the meanings behind the page, the, the cards, it can give you a character motivation an action motivation an end to a scene. And it's like, and it's like, let's say, what is it? Say you draw like what the five of swords is where you're laying in the bed and this and this and you are basically on the verge of death or the eight of swords where you're bound and blindfolded and surrounded by swords and there's no way to leave without cutting yourself. Um, those are excellent. You know, if you're in a place and you're like, I don't know where to do this. Well, these are, those are one is where a, someone is just, they're so done. They have to take a break. And the other one is the person has trapped themselves. And so you can ask your character, what did you do to trap yourself in this situation? What did you do to make it so you can't leave where you are at without hurting yourself? So they can help you solve problems that you feel stuck on. I just considered a writer's block tool that I'm very glad you gave me to get around things when I needed. 
And we've mentioned some really good videos on your channel. Would you be doing more videos on your channel coming up soon? I, for the last year and like uh, two months now, I've been struggling since February of last year. I've been struggling with recurrent migraines five, six days a week. Sometimes I'll have multiple days that are eight, nine, 10 level migraines. I've been on so many medications and unfortunately I, I went from doing two streams, sometimes three streams a week to doing two or three streams a month. And we apologize I, I, for the kitty too. It's okay. Is it your kitty or my kitty? It's yours. No, it's mine. It's mine. Sorry. Yeah. No. Um, it, yeah, I have a house full of animals. I live on a farm. Yeah, um, the nursery. It's that one is actually outside. He is outside wow. the window of the office. He's got pipes on him. He is this tiny little five month old, and he has got pipes. Um, I I would like to get back to Five AM Writers Club. I would like to get back to the Tarot for Writers streams. Mm -hmm. Um. But I just right now, unfortunately, I I can't. And you it's will a, have you come when you're able to do it in your pace and your time and your stride. Because we love you so much. Everyone just, needs to go enjoy the content you've already made because it's good content. Yeah. Well, I just I just like helping other writers because you know, I I the books that I'm putting out, the things that I write, I just do this because I'm a storyteller and because literally writing since my stroke when I had to relearn to write after my stroke because I lost all my words you don't realize how many words you use in a day until you cannot make the word you need come out of your mouth you know you want to say this word but you literally cannot make it come out of your mouth come out of your fingertips and I learned to write literally to relearn language after my stroke I learned the words I are to, literally power for you. I had this was my overcoming. And I'm all, you know, I write all this overcomer fiction. And like even in my sci-fi and fantasy, my characters are struggling to overcome their internal breakage. And in everything I write, women's contemporary fantasy, action, science fiction, fantasy, all of everything I write, there is this theme of having to overcome. And um, it's because I, I have always done this. I live this way. I, I mean, I, I overcame an abusive parents by putting myself in therapy when I was 15. They didn't put me in therapy because it was the 1980s and only crazy people with therapy. But I put myself in therapy. And then because they were good Christian people, they couldn't throw me out of the house or it would look bad on them for the church. Right. So... You know, get yourself, I mean, if you're struggling with mental health issues, there's a phone number you can call to get help. You you start journaling, write down your inner demons, get them out of your head. And so unfortunately that led into this thing with my OCD of once I start writing a story, I have to finish the story. Yeah. Because when, when I had my stroke and all the memory loss that I had with it, part of it that went was my man, the management skills I had learned for this obsessive need to finish things. So that's why I ended up with a 1.5 million word, 1.4 million word series that had never been edited. Do not do this. Do not build the mountain range because then you're going to have to climb it, chip pieces off of it and speckle pieces on it. And that takes a long, a lot of energy. But and you are doing an amazing job. You learning, really are. Yeah, learning it, learning to, learning this, I mean, and you have to realize and never say you can't do it as a writer because Thank Relic you. of Time Wars started as a 30,000 word fan fiction. <gasps> of, dirty word, dirty word. I said it and I'll say it again. Um, started as a 30,000 word fan fiction created off a four minute music parody video done by my friend Jorge and his wife, Christine. Um, they were using Minecraft as an animation generator to, to do this story with two other YouTube creators. And then they decided to do this music video with one of the other guys. And they did this music bit, this music parody this anim with this Minecraft animation. And it basically tells the print, the story of 
of Karstein and Damien, only it's it, the, the, the actor's name is Carlo. It's Carlo and Damien. And so there was this little boy, there was this scene, just this little tiny scene of this little boy running through this garden with this iron golem dragging him. And my kids were like, who is that little boy? I don't know why they fixated on this other than the middle has always been obsessed with having a little baby brother and even tried to trade her sister as a newborn to the woman in the room next door who had twin boys. <laughs> I wish this, I, the, she was three and a half and she was trying to trade off a newborn sister for her baby brother. <laughs> Kids say the darndest <laughs> things oh and she even had God. this whole thing prepared and said now you'll have a match set <laughs> so anyway um yeah so they so they were like who is this little boy and so then i ended up writing this story how this little boy was secretly the good prince's son and he had been hidden to protect him and that became the seed of, uh, that actually became War of Prophecies, which was the very first one. And then we had to expand the backstory and then go forward. And then other things happened. And then we started moving on. And then if you're a gamer, if you are going through the whole Relic of Time War series, you will see how long I've been a gamer. Because things will start popping up. Things from As Assassin's Creed. Things from... Um, Clash of the um, Clash of the Titans things or not um, Attack on Titan um, things from um, um, oh goodness Echo is that yes that sounds the, familiar no oh, they just they did a remake of it oh I can't think of the game now um, you have to kill the thirteen behemoths. To bring the princess back to life. The main character's name is Wanderer. Come on, Cheesecake Man, don't let me down. Um, I was about to say, Cheesecake Man, have you played this game? I know he's played this game. I know he's played this he game. He might uh, actually be it was a huge himself game. right now. You, you kill you you kill the behemoths, and like the the poison of their dark magic's escaping basically kills you, and you revive in the temple. And then you have to go kill the next one. And for each one you kill, their their statue crumbles because they were cursed and trapped in there in their shadows. And you see, like, every time you revive, you'll see their shadows. Shadow of the Colossus? Shadow of the Colossus. That's it. That's it. You will see, you will see a lot of that in there. Um, just, just, um, there's, there's so many, um, Halo references. Um, just you can see oh where God, the, I was gaming so much. You can see my gamer history like woven through this. Um, Starcraft is in there. Um, yes, Starcraft shows up at least once in every book in some way for you. I I was so addicted to that game, and and I I was. <sighs> I still don't know how I feel about Sarah end up becoming. I was going to ask, but not ask because that's kind of spoilers. I, I, that is spoilers. still one. That is still one that I struggle with because when she became the Queen of Blades, I mean, she genocided planets. That's and where I'm like, at, and it's like, tiki, e, e, e. Oh. Um, but but yeah, but um, so yeah, it's. Your I books are amazing. You're amazing. I mean, Seriously. I appreciate it. Thank you. I I just you are. I, my thing is 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 I look at it this way, you know, with this thing, I, I don't know how long. I don't know what's gonna happen. So I'm just telling the stories and getting the words out and trying to be as encouraging as possible because it's like, I mean, there are days when I'm like walking around the house with like limping, like unbalanced because of the stroke issues. And it's like, I can't remember like 30 seconds ago, let alone. But the, the thing is, is if you can, if you want to tell the story, if you love the story, if you love the words, it will come out. Do I have bad days where I literally write the same scene in 10 different ways? And then the next day I'm looking at it and I'm like, what was I doing yesterday? What are you doing today? Yeah. Right, okay. Now I have to sort through and figure out which is the best one. Um, yeah. There are days that I do that. And 
there are days that I can't write at all. Like right now, the new medication they have me on for my migraines, I can't write creatively right now. It's a really weird thing that I can't write creatively, um, that I'm struggling to do anything creative. Um, I try to to like like knit knitting a hat. Normally, I can do that in like two or three days. It took me like two or three weeks because I wow. literally I could not could not do the from here out to here. So it's, but I. You're enjoying so, the process as much as you can. And that's all we care about. Yeah. And it is, but I'm getting a lot of editing done because the logic brain is still working. So yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness, Aristotelian logic brain. So please check out Mama Maggie and all the places. Again, there are some links in the description box below. So do be sure to follow around and thank you all for being here because you know what I'm going to say. You better be taking care of yourself. You've been worth it from the beginning. Thanks for being here with me, Mama Maggie. It was so fun. Um, and, and definitely go to Reem. Check out Jenna's stories on Reem now. She is always on Reem. And, and if you haven't read the Myrtle Annals, you really should start reading them because, damn it, Nefertiri. <laughs> You have every, wait a minute, which book are you on right quick, may I ask? Have you read book two yet? I think that's, it's on my Kindle. I don't know. They all run together. Just, <laughs> I just, I tap instead of swiping. So I don't know. I just go to the next one. She might be as far as Frey and Lee jumping from towers. So if you're that far. Yes, because that, re, that, um. I have a scene in War of Prophecies where Karstine and Damien are jumping at a at jumping between towers That's attacking each other. I was wondering other. if that made you giggle during. So yes, thank you, Mama Maggie, so much for all you do. Thank you all for being here. And if you have any questions for Mama Maggie on the replay, add them to the comments here, or go track her down on her YouTube channel. You can Take care find yourself. me on YouTube, you can find me on Facebook, you can find me on Instagram, um, on my Inkit page where you can get all my books for free. Um, if you hit up my Kofi page, um, I will send you a book, the ebook or Moby file of your choice, whatever book you want. I am I understand there are people who don't want to support Amazon, and I am trying to like find a different avenue to make sure you can get what you want. Um, I just my thing is um Writing shouldn't stress you. Writing, writing should be the thing you love. It should be the thing that brings your heart joy. Um, marketing should be the thing you hate. Um, but <laughs> yes, maybe you know not, what? but totally understood. Yeah, no, but yeah. And if someone says, you know, understand this. Early in my writing journey, I was told it's obvious you have brain damage. You should just stop. No. That was on a rejection letter I got. That was on a rejection letter I got from an agent. From the same publishing house that had put out Anne McCaffrey's books. And I almost cried. Um, yeah. So don't. Don't let yourself give up. Love your words. Love your stories. But when you publish them, be sure to let them go. And you know what? As indie authors... We have so much more freedom than trad pub authors because if there's a mistake in our copy, literally we can submit the new copy and in 72 hours, pff, mistake is gone. If, if you want to pull your series down, rewrite the series, put them back out again. Wait, no, Jenna's over there. <laughs> we, are both, we have both done this. I ran the entirety of Relic of Time Wars through on Vela. Yep. Pulled it down, retask it out, put everything back in I had cut. So do not be afraid as an indie author to say, okay, it's time to go 2.0 on this story and upgrade. You can do that. You can believe in and yourself. You can definitely do it and take care of yourself too along the way. On that note, see you all later. Let's rock it out. <laughs>